Fearscape Media Network. Exploring the unknown, one podcast at a time. Hi, do you enjoy diving into true crime? And tales of the paranormal? Then join us, I'm Anna. And I'm Lindsay. On our podcast, Ghosts in the Attic, Bodies in the Basement. A Fearscape Media Network podcast. New episodes air every other Friday on wherever you listen to your podcasts. Hey everybody, Stefan here. This episode is sponsored by the great folks over at Box Mountain. Box Mountain is a subscription box service that has my favorite sub box yet, the Cryptid Crate. You see, Josh got one of these for his birthday, and I was super jealous because it was packed full of merchandise pertaining to cryptids. The box he received first was all about the Flatwoods Monster, which of course is one of our favorites. And it had a t-shirt, a book, a patch, mug, and some awesome stickers. So I checked out the price to get one for myself, and let me tell you, it is well worth the value. These make excellent gifts for yourself or even friends that are cryptid lovers as well. Now, if you use the coupon code FEARSCAPE, you will get 25% off the first month for any new subscription or 10% off individual purchases. So go ahead and head on over to FearscapePodcast.com slash CryptidCrate now and get yourself one today. Thank you for tuning in to Fearscape Paranormal Podcast. We are on a journey to understand and to discover the phenomena that it seems to exist all around the globe. We invite you to join us on this journey into the unknown. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another fantastic and conspiracy theory filled episode and drama filled episode of Fearscape Paranormal Podcast. I'm your host, Stefan Gearhart, and I am joined as always by the freshest dude I know, fresher than the Fresh Prince himself, Mr. Josh Rutledge. What up, brother? Uh, that is uh, a heck of an intro, man. I appreciate it. Your pits uh, always smell good, man. Well, I, you know, I really, I'm really aspiring to get the throne like Fresh Prince had in in the show. You know, the beginning. Oh yeah, oh, that would be sweet. Like if I just had that as my office chair. You know, put it on some rollers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That would be tight, man. That'd be a sweet office chair. Um, but yeah, man, I'm glad you're here. We got a really cool show, man. We've got, uh, we are interviewing uh, Andy Colvin tonight. Yeah. I'm super pumped to give you a quick bio on Andy Colvin. Uh, says here, Andy Colvin is an eclectic artist, photographer, filmmaker, publisher, musician, and New York Times, Amazon bestselling author who has been called one of America's great pain in the butt original thinkers. This man has written and co-written over 50 books, mostly all on the paranormal. Um, he is the reason for um, all of these wonderful books coming back into publication of Gray Barkers and John Keels and, and uh, Woody Derenberg and all this stuff. Without Andy Colvin, it probably would not have seen uh reprint again um he, he i mean this is the he's, publisher of the new saucerian press man which yeah. is we love right i mean and he's like he's he, i think he's still got some books in the work around some of uh john keel's collection right oh yeah collective writings and stuff that are yeah. coming so i mean yeah he's he's uh i say between you know him and uh alan greenfield is probably the closest we're ever going to be able to get to interviewing gray barker yeah, because this man, Andy, knew Gray Barker, which was super rad. Um, and man's been off the grid for five years. So uh, yeah. somehow we snagged him and grabbed him. And uh, the universe brought us together. So I'm super excited for you guys to hear this interview tonight because we are going to be asking our tough questions like we always do. And uh, we'll be getting into that. But just stick around for that because uh, first we need to get into our segments. And of course, our first segment of the week is Psychic Word of the Week. And now, the psychic word of 
the week. Psychic word of the week comes from the psychic, excuse me, the encyclopedic psychic dictionary from June G. Bletzer, PhD. Rest in peace, honey bear. I flipped through the pages and landed on page 240. Um, and the, the the actual first phrase that I saw was fools in Christ, but there's nothing there. It just says Christian psychics, and I'm not going to, that's too short to be talking about. <laughs> but I mean, that's pretty cool. I'm like, I want to hang out with a fool in Christ, some Christian yeah. psychics. Um, but uh, above that grabbed my attention as well. This is foolish fire, foolish fire. And here's what foolish fire says. Foolish fire, a flitting, flickering light, sometimes phosphorescent, sometimes pale and misty, taking on the shape of a person, at times looks like small balls of light or candle flames, seen mostly hovering around graveyards and marshy grounds, named foolish because only fools follow it. Uh, other definitions here from folklore says uh, a discarnate entity misleading night travelers, a German uh definition here says a wandering soul mind not finding refuge in either heaven or hell from russia it is the soul mind of an unbaptized child uh another european one here the soul minds of dead warriors guarding the treasure which was buried with them uh, another I mean, man there's like 10 definitions here another one says a helpful light that leads one out of danger uh, another one an earthbound entity wandering around in an erratic manner uh, number seven, an astral shell that cannot disintegrate because of the past owner's love for earthly desires. <laughs> Sounds like Gollum. Um, eight, a nature spirit wanting to be heard. Uh, and then finally, nine, this is the scientific one. It says a spontaneous gas caused from decomposed matter. So foolish fire. So you know what it reminds me of is uh, the wisps from uh, Brave. Oh, yeah, for a number of different things. I mean, second yeah. that she said the lights you see in the graveyard, I was like, okay. I mean, that's just another word for lit up orb, Keith. Yeah. Well, you know, <clears throat> um, there, there's a Facebook group that I uh, belong to on, on Facebook, um, <laughs> given that. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, they, apparently the one of the moderators had posted something the other day that um, – they had to delete a bunch of comments and, you know, reiterating, hey, people follow the rules. So I, I looked, I realized that I had never actually read the rules. So I read the rules. And like rule number four is don't post pictures of orbs. They're just <laughs> dust or bugs. Oh, my God. I'm like, who are you to say that they're just dust that, or bugs? That you have 100 percent sought out every single orb that has ever been documented and you were able to distinctly and accurately say that every single one of them is dust and a bug because yeah. even keith is like well i mean occasionally yeah <laughs> there's an orb that's legit it's legit <laughs> like right. even keith who hates orbs this right. man's got a picture of an orb that he's like this is an orb, orb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah it's just but it's just that kind of stuff that but i really get it though because yes me. i mean i agree a lot of them are dust and light dust. refractions and yeah. things like that and then all of a sudden I mean, you're if, getting a hundred posts with people if, posting an orb if you're up in an metal. if you're up in an attic of an old building you're stomping around and shit I mean, you're gonna stir things up i mean it's yeah. just gonna happen so but yeah i mean just just so i mean if it gets to to cut down but still um very uh, very cool about the because it, it did really pop into my head about the the whole wisps that mm -hmm. kind of led her to the witch you know to, yep to do her fate and all that kind of stuff. I'm probably copywriting infringement right now at Disney. They're going to take the show down. I mean, you just said the word Disney. It's over. Yeah. Disney, 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 Disney. We're still here. Okay, good. Um, but yeah, so thank you, June G. Bletzer. Uh, foolish fire. Really cool. Lots of definitions. Lots of cool stuff to think about. Um, yeah. But yeah, anywho. Uh, well, let's go ahead and move right on to our newest segment that we're going to do another one on, which is the Mandela Effect. Did you say Mandela? No. no. I said Mandela. I said Mandela. No. The Mandela the Effect. Mandela Effect. So yeah, we, uh, if you recall, uh, we started a new one here, which is the Mandela effect. Um, 
and or the Mandela effect. Now I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah, you're doing it. Yep. <laughs> There's so many of them. I don't even know what to choose. Um, but they're usually pretty small, so I'm gonna probably choose two. Um, but the Mandela effect is something that people remember a certain way while others remember it the way that it exists now there's a lot of theory of course that says that it's a dimensional shift um some of us existed in a different dimension and we shifted over and so we're we're remembering the other dimension where it was spelled different or handled differently or um the event itself was done differently so um this week on the mandela effect what i've got here is the kit kat candy bar okay so if you've just had an existential crisis about the fact that there's no hyphen between kit and cat know that you are not alone i, I am one of them that have always remembered a hyphen in between kit and cat for kit cat but it's not it I just says kit cat i don't remember there ever being a hyphen i think no. that the packaging though the packaging, okay, so here I'm going to try to say what it is. The packaging used to be that that cat, like in the in the line of text, it was kit, and then down off the top margin a little bit was cat. And so I wonder if, like, people are thinking that the T crossed the T and kit was the hyphen for cat. I don't know. I'm looking at the logo, which has not changed since... Uh, like the 50s or 60s um, yeah it that that's not I mean it's there it just the, the the T curves and the 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 cross up top is very high it doesn't fit in that regards um, but I'm telling you I'm looking at because you know they always do a mock-up of what you know what it yeah. what we thought it said and I'm like yeah that's what it said that's what it looked like um, but yeah so I'm interested to know if any of you else out there also thought that there was a hyphen in Kit Kat like I did um, <laughs> um, this next one is one that really gets people's goats really gets people's goats I have had some massive debates over this is uh, the, the Monopoly man Mr. Moneybags himself many of us including myself remember him having a monocle he has never ever ever had a monocle ever yeah he has no he has not he has always just been plain faced no glasses has never had a monocle but i recall i remember a monocle as well but I've talked to a lot of people that say, no, he never had one. And, you know, this website that I pull these from, they do the accurate research and stuff like that. Yeah, no, it never existed. They they posit here that they think that there's a confusion between him and the planner's peanut, Mr. Peanut, um, that we recall a monocle. But I like I'm looking at a picture here of like a, a, an artist depiction of him with a monocle. Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean, I remember that being what it was. <laughs> that's what's so amazing about the Mandela effect, my friend, is that I'm, we have very strong memories and they are inaccurate. I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious now. If Monopoly, the game didn't have a monocle, but like Monopoly, the McDonald's game. <laughs> Had a, had a I mean, you can do some research here, but on this on this website, they they found nothing that actually had a monocle besides people's artist rendering saying, "Where's the monocle? This is what it should look like." And then you know, people like go into garage sales trying to find original Monopoly that has this. <laughs> that there's a conspiracy theory. Um, well, but yeah, my my, um, my grandparents, you know, were, were were cleaning out their house, and they have. A bunch of old board games so now i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to look for mm -hmm. it gonna have to go look man gonna have to go look um but yeah so that's mandela effect this week man is kit kat uh no hyphen and uh monopoly man uh no monocle so yeah bye felicia let's get into our final segment here before we get to mr colvin uh which is creepy ketchup creepy ketchup creepy Ketchup. Creepy ketchup. Creepy ketchup. Y'all, it's creepy. All right, creepy ketchup. Dude, I actually have creepy ketchup. Woohoo! And it's not cats, and it's not wow. lights in the sky. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Dust particles floating around your it's, house. 
orbs. No. <laughs> so last week uh, at work, um, and this happened twice in one day to me. So uh, as you head out of my office room, uh, that where I work, uh, the big the big space there to go out to the main hallway where the bathroom is. Uh, the little hallway to the door has two boardrooms on either side, right? And so a lot of the higher ups will come in, they'll use those boardrooms and stuff. Uh, but anyways, I was walking by and uh, out of the corner of my eye, I see this old guy sitting, uh, If the there's a long table and he's sitting all the way on the furthest side on the last chair, he's just sitting there kind of with his uh, hands fingers crossed sitting there and he just kind of looks down he's in a, a suit he's just an older guy glasses bald and uh i'm walking by and i was like nobody's supposed to be in there because we didn't have higher up so i usually know who's gonna be in there and i was like who is that and i was just like weird man weird and so i just walked on went to the bathroom and when i came back um he was gone but i was taking a dump so um i assumed maybe he finished what he was doing but I got a weird feeling about it, man. Like, I mean, and I kind of picked up, but the dude kind of seemed kind of forlorn. So uh, a couple hours later, heading to the restroom for another round of dropping the kids off at the pool. Um, and uh, which, which I call extra break at work. Um, I'm walking and uh, out of the corner of my eye, I see this guy again. And I'm like, why is he back in there? And so like I back up and I'm like, wait a minute, because I saw him full as day again. I backed up. I was like, wait a minute. Who is it? Because he was sitting in the exact same position as he was a few hours before I backed up. Nobody was in there. Mm -hmm. No body. Was your building like how old is your building? I don't know how old my building is, but I was told that it was Phoenix College. It was like a very small independent college before we bought it. And I'm like, yeah, dude felt kind of like a professor. Like, mm. I remember thinking about that, that like, man, dude felt like kind of a professor. And I'm wondering, I'm like, man, did he lose a student or is he just sad that he's still stuck here? Like, that's that's the feeling that I got. And is uh, there a, is there a whiteboard in that room? Yes. Yes, there is. Maybe you should go in there sometime when the big wigs are not going to be there. <laughs> Ask an existential question and see if mm -hmm. he answers it. Yeah, because um, today I felt him. I didn't see him. But then I was like, am I just am I pushing that? Is that am I just trying to feel that? I don't know. So but yeah, that was my big thing. I mean, and I even told, you know, a couple people at work and they're like, no way, dude. Um, so but yeah, so that happened well, to me. You got all kinds of ghost cred now. I know I do got ghost cred. Um, but what about you, Josh? You have anything to catch up on? Yeah, so I've, I have two things. Um, one, I was coming home. For, I'd run to the, to the uh, grocery a, a few nights ago, and I was coming home, and I was just like, I, I'm, I'm super jealous because you have seen a daytime UFO twice. And so it was, it was not. <laughs> Arizona, it was not, Josh. Yeah. Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> it was not nighttime. Um, but it was like getting there. Like it was, I guess what you call it dusk. And so I decided, I was like, well, well, maybe I should just be looking in the sky as I drive home. There's nobody on the road. You know, I'll just glance between the road and the sky. So, um, I kind of glance up and I say verbally out loud, is anybody up there that wants to show themselves to me? Boom. A flash of light. Shut up. At like. Like probably about uh, as far as my position in the car, probably about my 11 o'clock at about maybe 70 degrees off the horizon. So pretty wow. far up there. Um, and I was like, well, OK, maybe it's a plane. So I just kind of watched the same general area for like the next 30 seconds. Never flashes again. <laughs> so That's cool. I, I was like, OK, oh, well, if that was really you do it again. And it did it again. Ooh, so man, so, you're doing some kind of CE5 type stuff, yeah. man. Connecting there. So then I'm like, I gotta hurry up and get home and get my laser pointer and see if you know, see if I can see. <laughs> but like I, so I got home real quick and like I put all the groceries inside so like all the cold stuff wouldn't go bad and and um, grab my laser pointer and it was just there was just nothing out there. I mean, like I signaled a couple times at various places and nothing. I mean, so it it was it wanted to be seen, but it only wanted to be seen at that particular time. So right fascinating um, dude very so that's 
So that's the one thing. Um, the second is uh, I was watching um, the documentary about, and I'm totally going to blank on her name right now. The the woman who has the ten thousand meters of uh, film that oh, you said. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, were, we talked about it on the Krista Alexander interview. I can't remember yeah, the name she, of the doc. She's, uh, I believe, is... No, never mind. I was thinking she was mentioned on that list that we saw today, but she is not. But she is no, in our topics not. list, so while you're talking about it, I can pull it up here. Yeah, but um, she, there's a documentary. It's 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 not Lights in the Sky, but it's something like that. It's like uh, uh, filming the lights or seeing the lights or something like that. But anyways, I've seen the light. One of the things that she, she talks about is... is um, she would hear this like high pitch ring in her ear, in her ear, mm-hmm. uh, whenever they wanted her to come to the window with her video camera, and then they would present themselves to her. Yeah. Uh, so it was almost like a reverse CE five. <laughs> Dorothy Izot, that's her name. There you go, Dorothy Izot. I kept wanting and, to say uh, Dorothy. I don't remember the name of the doc, but uh, they referenced her lights as the Vancouver lights. That's what. Yeah, and that. And I did end up. I, I I bought the book that. Um, is her story that the mm-hmm. documentary was built off of or based off of, but um, I haven't read it yet. But anyway, so that she, she talks about how she'll get this high pitch ring in her ear. And then that's when she knows to go to the window and look in a certain direction. And that's where they present themselves. And I, I started noticing that there are times, like I don't have uh, tinnitus. Like I never get ringing in my ear, but there are times when I do get, ring like it i get like a high pitched tone in my ear well i will tell you this real quick i do get it's called tinnitus by the way um you i do have tinnitus i've had it for probably since i was 13 or 14 when i got diagnosed with it um and the ringing that i get when weird paranormal thingies happen very different yeah it's very different so i've just been noticing now like actually recollecting so the other day i made some kind of weird random conspiracy posts in our chat but when i did that i got that high ring in my ear wow and so it's like you know is that telling me maybe that's not so crazy conspiracy theory to you like yeah that. no it's extra cool for you and by the way the documentary is called capturing the light it is there you free go on uh amazon prime if you have an amazon prime membership yeah. so very so cool, that's man. that's my creepy catch-up but it's still some really cool stuff happening cool man uh well uh the, w- w- I don't know about you, but I'm ready to get to to, to Andy Colvin, man. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward. To it. I've been looking forward to it for a long time. So yeah. me too. So uh, go ahead and just uh, hang loose for two seconds, and uh, we're gonna jump right into uh, the interview. Getting spooky with Andy Colvin. We'll be right back. Hello, blanket huggers. Stefan here. On March 28th, 2021, Josh and I received a message through our website's submit a sighting form from someone claiming to be Terry R. Wrist, the man referenced in Hell Here, and the man interviewed by Alan Greenfield in Secret Cipher of the Euphonauts. From there, we received a number of cryptic emails filled with information on places to search for answers to the larger mystery of the quest and journey Josh and I have been on. So we decided, fake or not, we should take it seriously, as much of the information given panned out and definitely opened our eyes to many new things. So we enlisted the help of Astral Stew co-host Santosh and Fearscape guest and Greenfield's publisher Olaf Phillips. Together the four of us have been digging deeper and deeper into not only the true identity of our source of paranormal gold, whether he is the Terry Wrist or not, but also into the mystery of the information given us. It has led us to some amazing doors into such things as the Secret Space Program, Hollow Earth, Darrow and Tarot, caves, underground bases, government cover-ups and conspiracies, and so much more. So if you would like to learn more about these emails, Terry's advice on where to look for more high strangeness, and our conversations and discoveries thus far, please become a monthly subscriber to our Patreon called Wristwatch at fearscapepodcast.com slash support or patreon.com slash fearscapepod. There you can get access to the emails themselves, the WhatsApp conversation about it all with Josh, myself, Santosh, and Olaf, and even any new clues that we have found. You can even join the investigation and add anything you have found to help us dive deeper into the mystery. You will also get access to other Fearscape-related things, such as extended interviews with guests not aired on the show, early access to Estes sessions with us and friends, and so much more. Wristwatch is a Patreon exclusive for our most dedicated fans. Join today and discover why the truth 
is now. All right. Thank you guys so much for sticking around after the break. As promised, we have Andy Colvin here, who, in my opinion, um, is the, you know, in theater, we have our triple threats, right? We've got our actor, dancer, singer, which, you know, I was until I had my knee uh, blow out on me. But Andy, you're like the quadrillion threat. I mean, you're an artist, a photographer, a filmmaker, publisher, musician, author. I mean, whew, man, I mean... You, like, sir, is that you, sextillion? You are a renaissance is? man. <laughs> I, I'm not very successful in, uh, in any of them, really, though. <laughs> hey, neither are we, but that doesn't matter. Creativity is yeah. what matters, man, because, uh, you the know, to the soul. The, exactly. Yes. Boy, Josh, you just read the language of my soul when you said that. <laughs> um, but no, we are very thankful here. Of course, we know you very well for your publishing efforts as well as your um, writing efforts. Um, you, in in our opinion, are the reason why people are able to have access to who we consider in our community the greats, like John Keel and Gray Barker and and Darren Berger and all of those people. You have allowed that to kind of s- sneak its way back into the public's conscious. I mean, I mean, we're looking at over all the books here that you have dealt with, and we have most of them. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> so. I mean, yeah, there's there's several books that I've I've even uh, looked at the at the front cover to see who the publisher was. Like, oh, New Saucerian. How the hell do I get a hold of the people at New Saucerian? So you know, it's just to see what else am, am I missing? What else has not been printed or reprinted yet? So, well, there's some people that that, that aren't very happy about all that. They they <laughs> they've characterized it in the complete wrong way, and. Uh, <clears throat> so some people uh, think that I uh, are always pulling things and uh, whatever, and it's not true. I, I simply was so into this stuff like you are. I'm older now. Maybe I've taken a step back, you know, from it. But at mm-hmm. the time, I was totally engrossed, and I learned everything I could about the history of ufology um, even cryptozoology. I was on a lot of the cryptozoology lists years ago, 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> that was Yahoo, you know? Ah, the old Yahoo <laughs> days. Uh, yep. Yeah. And uh, so, and it was, you know, all fueled by the fact that I was, had grown up amidst all this stuff. So when I finally found out about the Keel stuff in the early 90s, I just, I read it and I thought, okay, I'm really glad someone finally wrote an, a, a book about my neighborhood. Wow. Yeah. Because yeah. it was so weird and I never had anybody that I could ever really talk to about it. You could m- maybe mention it to your family or something, but then they would be like, ah, oh, you know, you're full of it. You, uh, yeah. These are people that actually had the same experiences. Right. Right. Well, yeah, you know, it's something we talk about quite a bit is that um, I think a lot of times people just shut it out because they are, are too afraid to process what it would mean. So, yep. Um, so kind of speaking of of, of kind of I uh, wrote about your neighborhood. So I, I think I, I read somewhere. Um, I'm pretty sure I read somewhere that you were like seven years old uh, and you had your own Mothman experience. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah, it was right after the the first sightings because Mothman was actually seen in my neighborhood at the same time as Point Pleasant. Hmm. And it was on the nightly news that he was seen, but there weren't any uh, bio, bio, what do you call, I don't know, uh, there weren't any articles about specific people. Hmm. Like in Point Pleasant, they they zoomed in on four, four two couples. Right. Right. Boom, story. In Charleston, it was just on the nightly news that some people in this neighborhood had seen it, and they didn't really interview anybody. You know, therefore, no story. So it just went away, and there wasn't anything written down, really. Maybe an article or two in the paper, but I don't think those are in the museum. So does yeah, I don't uh, recall seeing anything there. Well, yeah, and I so long, when I went up, when no, I took that back, uh, I was going to say there was that sighting on 62 but that was indrid cold i got those two mixed up for a second so yeah um i don't was there yeah, a I don't, sighting of indrid on 62 yeah 
Well, like, it, like two guys were the the sighting of Indrid on sixty two. I think predates uh, Woody's Woody's sighting. Um, two guys were like coming home from work or something, and um, Indrid appeared to him appeared, appeared to them on the side of the road. Really? Yep. Because are you talking about sixty two between Charleston and Point Pleasant? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the road. I'll, I'm, wow. I'm not from the area, so I'm going to have to go look at a map real quick just to make sure that that's what I'm thinking about. But, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the road. Well, that's a very important road in a, in a lot of ways. Uh, I don't have a whole lot to say about my first sighting of Mothman. I just saw him flying behind the car, really. Yeah. Uh, I did have another experience later. But and, Josh, I, I actually think that you're thinking of uh, – it took place in New Jersey – um, not in West Virginia, the two boys, because that was October 16th, 1966, where they saw him. So, so then maybe it is standing maybe on the it, fence. So then maybe it is, uh, that I'm thinking of, and, and I'm, all this stuff is starting to run together a little bit. So I apologize, but maybe it is that I'm thinking of, uh, Mothman, uh, sighting happened to two other guys before he was yeah. seen at the TNT area. I think that's what you're thinking of because yeah, Indrid, this where he saw the two boys before Woody, this is where the grinning man thing came from was from the two boys there in New Jersey. Yeah, yeah. so isn't it was that, Isn't that the Yan Chida sighting? Correct. Correct. Yep. So yeah, um it, it is the moth it is a it is a Mothman sighting that predates the TNT sighting, and like I said, it did ha it did happen on sixty two, and it was to two guys who were headed home uh, from work. Oh, you're saying there was a Mothman sighting on sixty two? Yes. Weird. Okay. Yeah, we've been um, a lot. There's a number of different groups that are out there and stuff too, and a lot of people are still kind of putting out things too. Um, it's really interesting that people that have held on to stories for years are all of a sudden saying, well, you know, I did actually see this too. This happened to me, you know, during this time. So more stuff keeps coming out. I think the more and more it's getting popularized and stuff. Well, and then you got the Mothman sightings that are happening in Chicago. Oh, Chicago. I mean, all over the world, they've got that one down in South America that they're talking about. Yeah. And of course, you know, uh, a lot of these um, have been coinciding with these disasters, which is just feeding into that keel narrative that Mothman was warning people that this, the bridge was going to collapse, right? So, because there, well, there's another one I think happened in Ohio that where a bridge collapsed, and people say that they saw a creature very similar uh, near that bridge as well. Well, keel wasn't. He wasn't huge on the silver bridge thing. He, he he kind of tried to avoid that, actually. I think that's been uh, played up by other people more. And I think it's all it's kind of a dead end in a way. I know it's a horrible thing, and, and we yeah. even knew people. My parents knew people that died on the bridge. Yeah. Or it's just I'm not saying it's a – like I'm not making a joke. Yeah, it's just – Yeah. It, as far as research goes – I mean, the reason they do it is because it, on TV is because it's dramatic. Right. And, and then, and, and of course, TV, TV rules. So whatever's on TV is really the only thing that pretty much, I mean, people just don't read books that much yeah. like you guys. And so very few people have read my books. They're, they're not easy to read at all. They're super detailed and, um, and make, they'll make your head spin just because there's so much, I was just in like this mode that I, I've never been in before or since. Yeah. And the stuff just all started connecting and, and the book is, it's going boom, 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 boom. And it pretty much started with the first sighting of Mothman in Clinton in West Virginia. So what I did was I just started looking at all the places he was seen and trying to make some sense of why would he appear there. And the very first one was in Clinton and if you look up Clendenin, the only notable thing that's ever really happened there is it was the first site of the first petrochemical plant mm. in really? the twenties. <clears throat> Union Carbide. Okay. And Union Carbide plays into this in all kinds of other ways. So they see him flying over the graveyard there. I've been to the graveyard. You could probably at one time have seen the plant from the graveyard. Um, it's no longer there or it's been, there's a few little like ruins or something. Mm -hmm. 
but uh, that's a big thing. You know, the first petrochemical plant, and you know, if you know your keel, you know that there's a lot of uh, cryptid sightings around petrochemicals and UFOs. And so you go from there, and then it, and then the Mothman travels to Point Pleasant. But on the way, it comes by na- my neighborhood at the time. I actually later lived in Point Pleasant, cro- right across the river. But at the time, I was in North Charleston. So it, it, it was seen there. We have a carbide plant in North Charleston. And lots of people saw Mothman over that plant. And then it's, uh, but, but again, wasn't documented very well. Mm-hmm. Then it goes to the, to the TNT area and gets documented and so on and so forth. But I really, you know, since it started with carbide, I sort of stuck with carbide. I was like, what is this with carbide? Is yeah. Mothman, yeah, it's, it's, it's cool that Mothman tried to warn people of the bridge. And I think, it, I think he did. Yeah. Because of my personal experience with the creature, like whatever thing happens to you when you see it, um, and then you get actually get a premonition or a prophecy like I did, like, and I only had one. But the other thing about it is, and mine was of the 911 disaster, right? Really? So, and I had no concept of what that was. I knew it yeah, was going to really. be 2001, but that's all I knew. And Tommy said it was going to be the start of World War III, which I don't think we can really say. And maybe, it, can we say that World War III started? I don't think so, but. No. It, uh, it gets into you. And then, but one other thing that happened was when I saw that vision, I also got a download in my entire life. I felt like I saw everything that was going to happen to me, but it was too much to, to, to bear. So I forgot it all. Hmm. But I also don't think it was actually correct completely. Somewhat correct, not really. Uh, scenarios that might happen. So, and it still happens today. Like today I had one. I had a, I had a weird vision of something it felt like a deja vu and i thought that's one of those possibilities that mothman down gave me but i don't but i i now just sort of i get nervous you know and i might yeah i might um try to think about it more or i might try to forget it in the in the moment today i was like i tried to follow it but it just went away but i know that that's what it was and but there's been times when it was specific enough that it actually saved my life and this is the value of Mothman. It's, it's not, it is a collective unconscious thing, I think. Yes, the bridge is going to collapse, but it's also personal. And once you're connected to it, it can save you. It can save your kids. I've had witnesses tell me that Mothman saved their kids from getting on that bus that crashed. Mm. You know, it's super valuable. It's super important. I felt like I'd stumbled onto the story of the century. And, you know, and it is the same story that's Keel te- Keel's telling, but it's a, it's more detailed, it's more personal, yep. it's more um, powerful in a way. I mean, as as I'm not saying his story isn't powerful, but if if you could harness this somehow and people could make use of it, it would be you know yeah. a great thing. Well, that's the well, thing and- about Keel because Keel's story encompassed a lot of things, with Mothman yeah. just kind of being the overarching theme. But Gray's book, of course, Silverbridge, I feel really digs a little deeper in a lot of ways. Um, and I actually really preferred uh, Gray's book on everything. It was a fascinating read. Did you read the intro I wrote for that one? Yes, I did. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think I said so in the intro. Yeah, I absolutely love Silverbridge. It was it, it, and it, it was my first real taste of Gray's writing as well, which made me then get everything I could um, because he reminds me a lot of myself, you know, like he's kind of a jokester and a huckster, but he's at the same time wants to find truth. You know, he's just fascinating. And we've already said, I mean, that was like our big plan is next time we head out to Point Pleasant, we want to hit up his archives. I mean, just like you were talking about, it's like, I want to dig into everything that I can find on Gray. Same thing with Keel. I wish there was uh, a a library with Keel's stuff. Like... (laughs) I've actually uh, attempted to get the Keel stuff uh, put in the Gray Barker Library. That, that would be perfect. I haven't, I haven't gotten very far. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's. I've heard that their family, the they're not really open. Well, it's, I don't think it's. A, is it a family member that owns it right now, or is it is it a private party? Well, it's more complicated. Um, okay. <laughs> and I, I guess don't so. Pretend yeah. to know. I don't pretend to know 
what went on between Keel and his sister, but I know his sister. She's the one that licensed some of the books to me, mm-hmm. all the ones that were left um, over from Mothman, whoever did the other couple of books. And she's great. I love her. She's, um, we agree politically, everything. I, I don't, I don't understand if I've heard he had, they didn't get along, but I, I can't see why she's, she's, she simply Siblings. was unable because of her age and mobility, she wasn't able to go clean out his apartment. Mm. And I think people have taken that and misread what that was about. She right. simply just couldn't do it. She couldn't drive from Florida all the way up there and, and get the place cleaned out within a week or whatever it was. And so uh, I have a friend that went up there to help and I couldn't do it because I was in Seattle and I had some other stuff going on and uh, a kid, for instance, <laughs> so <laughs> God forbid, a job and stuff. But uh, my friend, John Frick went up and helped clean it out. And most of the st- cause he didn't want the stuff to end up in a dumpster. Yeah. We still don't, we still don't know what happened to all the cassette tapes, Jeez. but most of the papers went to Doug Skinner, who was <clears throat> John's friend in town who helped take care of him. Uh, to some degree in the in his final days or years i'm not sure mm-hmm. exactly how long but i'm hoping it's just one of those things that it ended up in somebody's private collection and then they're gonna die and somebody's gonna be like what is this stuff like what's happened with a lot of the doctor who missing footage that they found in people's private collections and stuff that have been able to fill a lot of the missing episodes it's kind of what i'm hoping I'm hoping like some kids like i don't know what's who's this john keel guy and like <clears throat> actually puts it out there and we find those cassettes and we find everything because yeah. the man's mind is well the, I, i've said so many times on the show before I, I would love to get a hold of his research that he did for uh, uh flying saucer to the center of your mind because um that's just full of all kinds of accounts and uh you know for sightings going back to the 1800s and so on and so forth and you know, he talks about how uh people were just like sending him newspaper articles from all around the country and like <laughs> i just would love to have copies of just copies of that stuff would be amazing so i think doug has all that stuff but um what and what he's doing is he's doling it out on a weekly basis he puts up another couple of pages on the johnkeel.com site are you familiar with that site yeah the uh yeah yeah don't they call it something else too i can't think of i tried to get doug to supply us with the estate with a an accounting of what he has but he doesn't seem able to do that. I think he maybe it's unorganized and he's just sort of pulling off the top of a pile or something. I don't know. That's yeah. the way it feels like. Yeah, because I mean, it's it's done very blog style. So it's very much like, here's some info I found today. <laughs> but yeah. I'm still like, yes, give me, <laughs> give me, give me. Well, maybe, maybe in a maybe in a few years, we could just uh, print off all the stuff that's on the website. So, <laughs> right. I'm looking at it right now. <laughs> um, well, I told it. I told him he should. Uh, think about donating all that stuff to the gray barker archives that would be fascinating i mean and then you know josh we could move there and we could handle it yeah we just go there for, <laughs> just go there for a week and and just spend all day every day in the archive yep. um so I, I wanted to kind of ask you real quick and this is a a theory that i've been kicking around and, and i'm not I'm not saying that I'm not, you know, the first one to have it, but um, something that is just kind of popped up when I first started reading about Mothman and, and just descriptions of Mothman and how he took off was, uh, you know, was Mothman not a creature, but an individual in a suit? Uh, and I'd like to know, you know, your particular thoughts on or reactions to. Especially with idea. your own sighting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if uh, God that's a good question never been asked that one. Oh, really yeah that's one we talk <laughs> about quite a bit you know is is could that is explain it? some of the weird aspects is that it was some sort of I don't want to say space suit but no but like some sort of a, a me, you know a mechanical uh, single operator suit uh, type situation where there was uh, some individual inside, you know, Indrid Cold, for all I know, um, you know, but <laughs> but uh, but just kind of the description that's given of of how 
uh, it took off like it didn't flap its wings to take off. It just shot straight up in the air and stuff like that. It just seems more like a, you know, a jetpack type situation or anti gravity or whatever you want to say, but more of like Ar- a archangel from X Men. Yeah, I mean, that's- <laughs> like a technology type thing. So. Yeah. Well, I, first question I would think of is why would they do that? And I can see where they would might want to stimulate sightings of certain creatures. Like I think this is my own theory that I've put out there. And I think John kind of agreed with me was uh, what if Mothman is real? It is a real force of nature somehow that mm-hmm. is, it, it, so when it's, let's say it's a Garuda, the Garuda basically protects people. Uh, who are who are weak and frail. He protects women, children, old, old ladies, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And and he comes around during times of crisis to save the world from destruction, from he, the heat of Indra. Now, does that nuclear power? Let's assume that I personally believe that the Earth is so old that we go through these cycles over and over. And we may have had nuclear power at some point in the past and Mm-hmm. different civilizations well and like, that would also make sense with him being near you know the tnt area other you know plants that are producing hot things you know i mean that that very much fits into yeah it. and they were doing nuclear stuff at the tnt area trust me um keel found this out he told me so they were building nuclear warheads they weren't building the whole bombs or anything just like a part of them Mm. And they were storing them at the DLA, which was a little ways down the road next to the river, which is a major like storage facility for the military. And they have uh, stores of expensive uh, exotic materials. And I went there, uh, I forget what year it was, maybe 10 years ago. And I found the old warehouses and there were thousands of bags of Cabracho bark. In these, in these sacks, lining all the walls of these warehouses, huh. and you could go in there, and and they were pretty run down, but, and I had a Geiger counter, and they were hot. Huh. Hmm. They've been using these bags of bark to 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 block the radiation of what was being whatever they were storing in there, and of course it probably was the warheads. So, and at the time they were actually bagging this stuff up and putting them in, in, in new bags, and and I asked them, what are you guys doing with all this stuff? And they're like, well, we're shipping it off to a, a company in China that uses them for women's aphrodisiac. <laughs> Aphrodisiacs. <laughs> like, oh, great. You're going to put radioactive material in things that women are going to take? Oh, Lord. Well, think about it. They're going to put radioactive material in a container and ship it overseas. I mean, that's how many how, people... That's oh, how great. Godzilla got created. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. so so they were... At that time, That there's an old part of the place the dla and the new part and all this was in the old part but they were taking the bags over to the new part putting them in new bags shipping them off and then they sold the whole place like a year or two later Mm. to a private somebody for a million dollars or i don't know they were auctioning it auctioning it off Um, probably uh, probably bigelow probably bigelow bought it (laughs) probably (laughs) and at the same time they're also auctioning off the sugar grove base in eastern west virginia which is a so, well, they were just really auctioning off the top part, the old part that has the old barracks. And there's a connection between these places, I think. And, uh, well, I know there is. So, yeah. because we had a neighbor who worked there and he was best friends with my dad. And uh, so he was working at this secret base with an underground part that controls the Atlantic submarine fleet. And they also intercept all of the digital traffic coming from the eastern seaboard. So any emails, uh, TV shows, phone calls, they all get intercepted by this base, Sugar Grove. Um, it's still there underground. They haven't sold that part off. We visited there. We looked at it. There were uh, license plates from cars all over the world. They obviously have an international you know, team there doing this stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's plugged into the Echelon uh, network, which is eavesdropping between all the NATO countries. Uh, and we all share information. So if you need to spy on someone here in America, they can hire uh, somebody from Australia or England 
to spy on them and they won't break any laws and we trade off our people that way. So I, I basically ended up uncovering this whole web of companies and uh, government agencies that are involved. A lot of them are involved in nuclear power. In fact, the world's first nuclear reactor was in North Charleston. It was just all secret. Mm -hmm. I talked to an engineer who helped dismantle it. And <clears throat> my dad worked there. So, um, and that's why he was, I think, murdered. We don't know for sure, but yeah, well, we he died had, of his, we had a he got shot in the back with something and developed a tumor. And, yeah, we uh, had we had come across some things talking about um, underground nuclear testing as well in Mississippi, West Virginia, Kentucky areas, and things like that. So that would definitely fit into that as well. Um, this this type of testing underground. I don't know that they were doing any testing there. Um, they were storing the, the radioactive water from the reactor in the tanks really close to my house. Mm. And so I took the Geiger counter there and I, sh and I got re readings there. Wow. This is about 10 years ago. So, but now they've removed a bunch of the tanks. I literally think that somebody's <laughs> sometimes I think they're watching me and they, and they react. So maybe I helped get rid of those tanks. I mean, not to straighten out our tinfoil hats here or anything, but they might be, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, I, mean, I feel I mean, like when you get close to shit, like stuff happens. You know what I mean? Like, I, I just, I agree. <laughs> well, and I mean, you know, when we left, um, when we left Point Pleasant uh, and all the stuff that we kind of got into down there with uh, various, you know, Estes sessions and seeing UFOs and Hokit and Caboodle, we, we felt like we were like having a little bit of MIB oh, man. experience yeah, for like the first week back. All of yeah. us had, we're having computer issues. I had this unmarked black <clears throat> helicopter land next to where I worked in this yeah. field in like and the middle of Louisville and just went right back up, like right in the middle of downtown, like Louisville. It was the weirdest thing, man. Shook the whole building and well, no wasn't, markings. Wasn't it like a, didn't like a single engine aircraft, like buzz your building too. Mm hmm. Yep. So, I mean, and then I had all kinds of weird computer things going on, and uh, my phone kept making glitchy noises whenever I would call people. <laughs> it and... was enough to make me paranoid. That's... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and then it's like we have we have guests on, or we just, you know, we talk about a certain theory or topic or something. We get really into it, and then that stuff kind of picks back up again, and it's like, you know, is somebody well, like Olaf? Yeah, Olaf Phillips, uh, Alan Greenfield's publisher and friend. Um, we were really getting deep, and we hit that. We were hitting an area, and all of a sudden, his computer just died. Was gone. It just shut down in the middle, and he's like, "Guys, this ain't gonna be fixed until tomorrow." So we just ended it right there. That's it was crazy. <laughs> well, I make stuff go bad, go uh, haywire myself, just by being around it. So. There was one point, you know, I did this 36 hour video series in 2001. It was probably the very first paranormal reality show. It was before all these ghost hunting shows and everything. Mm -hmm. And it's the Mothman's Photographer and it's what my books were named after. We took all the interviews from the video and put it into the books. Um, but when I was filming that, stuff would happen right in front of the camera. Like I get in Harriet's car and the window starts going up and down by itself. <laughs> And that stuff happens around her too. And she's, she's a Mothman experiencer too. And in fact, I think they based the Scully, <clears throat> the Scully character on her in a way, hmm. because she has the scoops on her mark on her neck. And her dad is the one who worked at the secret Navy base in West Virginia, which, you know, was a theme throughout the X-Files. Mm -hmm. yep. I don't know how they knew this <laughs> because that was before I, you know, publicize anything. Yeah, there's a lot but, of talk that the the folks, you know, Chris Carter and them, they had some information that they weren't supposed to have because some of that stuff does cut pretty close to some of the stuff we know about today. Yeah. I, I followed that, that thread. It's like they would do one monster story about a random made up monster and then we'd go back to the thread of Scully and the alien bases and stuff. And I was mm -hmm. totally into that. I thought, man, they're really, they've really, they're really telling that part of our story here. Hmm. And, but, and interestingly, that was around the time um, 
when Keel's uh, Mothman Prophecies was re was reprinted, uh, it was ninety three. So when was the X Files? Ninety one. Yeah, it was around that time. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> so you know, and it, <clears throat> we've got, and I don't know if you've uh, heard on, you know, I know you listened to a couple of the shows, but um, so we had uh, an individual contact us of uh, several weeks ago, like back in March, I think when it first started, uh, claiming to be terrorist. Uh, from the, you know, either from the interview with Ellen or from the, you know, uh, referenced in, in Hellier. Uh, we don't know if it's the same Terry. All we know is that this person is giving us a lot of good leads. Um, and one of the one of the more recent leads that have that have come in um, has something that has uh, some relationship to uh, to nuclear to nuclear power, which is which is interesting again because of tonight's conversation <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, being about Mothman and, and, and the, the interest in, in nuclear uh, warheads and things like that. So it's just really, we, we've, we've gotten messages uh, we, via a Ouija board as well as um, from again, this Terry individual that we sh- we need to go to someplace around Boulder, Colorado. Well, there's a nuclear there was a nuclear station where they were building nuclear weapons and in colorado that like had to be shut down in 1992 because it was leaking radiation across the state so it's just really interesting how this kind of stuff is uh, yeah, and then ties in with uh bob yeah. Lazar's old company eg and g so that was yeah. really interesting yeah so it's all it's all interesting and cool for sure so um i don't know um well, like I was telling Stefan uh, in the in the beginning of the show, uh, before you you know before we got on with you, is I feel like uh, talking with you and and probably talking with Alan Greenfield is probably the closest that we will ever come to being able to talk to you know folks like uh, Gray Barker um, or or John Keel, and so um, I'm just I'm curious here, and I'm going to ask an open ended question: um, Do you have and, I, and I'm sure that this is a, a short answer, but do you have an off the wall uh, theory about anything that's currently going on in the quote unquote paranormal world um, that maybe people haven't heard before? Well, there's a bunch. Of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Josh drops Probably. that hard, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just because there's a lot of pushback to my research and I, here's one. So, you know, 20 years, I, I mean, I've been a conspiracy guy for way longer than, you know, 20 years. Yeah. 20 years is my time pretty much involved in shooting up, you know, once I found out about 911 and I knew the Mothman prophecies was real, I started doing this video series and books and everything. Prior to that, it was it was another 20 years of conspiracy. <clears throat> and so um, I always I started to get a nose for who, you know, <laughs> for me, a lot of conspiracy is about figuring out your sources. Is your source honest or is your source a spook? Mm-hmm. Right. And I felt like I've always felt like since this Mothman stuff happened to me that I, ha- I can I, I am psychic. I mean, I know I am. I, I don't. Right. There are people out there that try to sell themselves as psychics. They do <laughs> readings, they do uh, whatever. I don't do that because I just think I don't think it's reliable enough. I mean, it it's it, it's there. Yeah. And I, if someone wants me to clear their house of ghosts, I can do it, but I don't like doing it. Yeah. And I think you sometimes can get into trouble uh, with something you're not ready for or something. But I, yeah. I haven't had that happen. But I also don't do it very much. But um, <clears throat> so I think I have a sixth sense about stuff and a lot of times stuff just pops in my head. And that's how I did a lot of the research. I, I, the main thing is that you make the effort. You start doing something. You start doing the blog like you guys are doing or you mm-hmm. start writing something, doing a video where you're trying to document stuff. And it's gotta be something real. It can't be just like Google research. Go, you know, right. go out, try to get some real people, yeah. interview some real people. And then it starts clicking and the synchronicity started happening. So I started following the synchronicities and I came up with a bunch of theories about all that. And I always wondered about who was a spook. Yep. (laughs) 
and I would try to keep it to myself. And then I figured out, okay, there's a way I can do this and, and without it being too heavy of an accusation. Because in the old days, if you made that accusation, you would be attacked ruthlessly and people would claim that you were going to be arrested because you, it's illegal to, to out a spook. And, but as time has gone by, they've stopped using real agents for things and now they just use contract spooks. So I think that's a different deal. Now you can actually, I think, out somebody for being a contract spook. Mm -hmm. and without repercussion unless they've changed the laws. Uh, so, but I used to wonder, because I felt like there were so many spooks in ufology and especially in cryptozoology, even more, because one of my theories I never really said that was Bigfoot is a way to get people distracted from Mothman because that's what happened. Mothman came along. It was super energetically magic like people just were like mothman and i was too and i think that somebody realized that was going to be trouble politically because if this thing can actually tell you who is doing bad stuff then all the bad people who run the government or these companies are in trouble mothman could bring them all down and i think they somebody probably realized this is a real thing and we need to shut it down well how do we shut it down we come up with bigfoot and so that's what happened. It literally right at the end of the Mothman um, era, when the bridge comes down, that's right Right before that's when Roger Patterson's movie came out. So everybody gets on to the Bigfoot train and Bigfoot leads you nowhere. There's yeah. Bigfoot is just a guy lumbering through the forest. He's not gonna tell you anything about anything. No. <laughs> so anyway, I guess getting back to that. So that's why the cryptozoology guys do what they do. They're continuing that thing, which is let's keep everybody distracted with this stuff that they're never going to find in the forest. And it'll never lead to anything that's going to change society, like say getting rid of nuclear weapons or yeah, right. finding out who worked with the Nazis. That's one of the things that I found out in my research through all following Mothman's trail, all these companies that were working with the Nazis. Yeah. Well, you know, are we supposed to just forgive them all? for what they did, uh, I think it's out there. All these companies have been researched. We know who they are. It's just, there's a media blackout on some things and that's one of them. We don't want to know who these companies are. We don't want yeah. to talk about it. Uh, but I always wondered why, why were the spooks, you know, there's that, I guess that has a value, but why would there be so many spooks in ufology? Well, originally I thought, and I think it was valid. I think they were there because someone might see a, a secret craft built by the Russians or whoever, and that needed to be vetted. And so we had our spooks out there watching the UFO people. Fine, good. <laughs> um, but as time went by, and say you start getting into the 90s or the aughts um, when I'm doing my stuff, I'm getting all kinds of weird uh, stuff going on. It was just like Keel. And in some cases, even weirder. And I'm still thinking, why? What is it about Mothman that's so important? And I, that, that I kind of understand. What I didn't understand was why are they still trying to cover up UFOs, for instance? Right. Or, yeah. Uh, and then, I, but then what happened was time passed. I never really answered it until now. And I kind of get it now. I, I, I realize now that what happened in around, around the time Keel died, say 2009. Um, and I have personal experience with this, so I'll bring it up. Roger Stone started infiltrating all the groups and he infiltrated my group, Mothy Talk. Mm -hmm. And he infiltrated a bunch, he started off with the JFK groups, JFK conspiracy people, which I'm one of them too. Uh, and then he got into the UFO groups and the Bigfoot groups and everybody else. And he started spreading all this stuff, which eventually coalesced into the MAGA movement. And so what you find today is you have a lot of cryptozoology people that are totally believe this stuff from Q. I know a lot of them myself. I know yeah, we not, do too. We do too. Up. We've come across it quite a bit, quite yeah. a bit. And so this is the, this is what they were leading up to. I think, I think somebody kind of figured this out and figured out that someday we can have control over a, a belief system that's outside of the church and not really, you know, we won't have to really answer to them. And we can kind of manipulate people in whatever direction we want using stories about UFOs, creatures, and et cetera. 
and and the and it just seems to get be getting more and more organized. Uh, more uh, media goes toward it. Um, y- young people are really are like forming uh, international research groups mm-hmm. that purport to be. You know, I was contacted by one yesterday, in fact. Um, <clears throat> And you know, I personally figure there's there's got to be a few spooks in there, and who are going to just make sure to keep the thing rolling. So I don't know if that's a new idea to you guys. It doesn't sound like it is, but that's kind of where I'm at. I, I think it. I think it's. I sort of feel good right now because I feel like I was right before. I was right in my suspicions about certain people. It didn't make sense at the time. And now it kind of does. Yeah, no, you essentially kind of helped coalesce some of our ideas together. And it it, it kind of helps clean yeah. up some of my thoughts. So, yeah, no. <laughs> so, it was, well, and it, yeah, you know, it's you, not a new thought, but it, it is in a way. So when and you talk about the, um, you know, the kind of media blackout, something I was thinking about uh, yesterday morning, I think it was. I was, you know, it's it's great, I think for uh ufo community ufology that uh people you know programs like 60 minutes and in sunday morning and cnn and all that kind of stuff are now talking about uh ufos and uaps um i I think it i think it potentially brings uh, in an audience that before probably heard about it but never really gave it you know much more than a than a than a a fleeting thought but i but i find it very interesting that you have um, Greer, uh, Dr. Greer, who is who is basically, you know, taking up the line of opposing everything that is being said about UFOs and UAPs, which, you know, it's something we talk about a lot is drama sells, right? People love a good drama. We, you know, people drive past a car wreck and turn and look because they want to know, they want to know about the conflict, what happened, you know, what's mm-hmm. going on. So. I, I it just it boggles my mind that no one has had Greer on to talk about an opposing opinion. And so it really makes me wonder if, you know, again, this is very conspiracy theory, but if there is some sort of a an underlying, you know, you know uh, control point where they want the media to only talk about the potentiality of threat. Yeah, yeah. What what's his point of view uh, exactly? You know? uh, Doctor 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 Stephen Greer. His point of view is that um, there are ETs visiting us. They are not in any way a threat, and they just want to you know kind of peaceful coexistence. They're waiting for us to uh, evolve as maybe a good word, but kind like of the evolve, word. Yeah, he uses yeah. that. You know, evolve our consciousness, so to speak, uh, to to basically. You know, move away from uh, fossil fuel usage and things like that to 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 elevate our thinking. And he uses uh, a very meditative approach yeah. uh, via contact. They they supposedly have a lot that a lot of evidence, and we've seen some of it um, that shows that they're able to call them to essentially come visit and things like that. There's been healing and things like that. Uh, and so he has been on a campaign right now calling out uh, Lou Elizondo and all those, uh, Marco Rubio and all those people and looking at disclosure as being disinformation agents. Um, I mean, he's putting them on hard blast right now. Yeah. <laughs> so. so, I mean, that's, that, his, his thing is, is that the, the message of it's a threat is a false flag operation. Yeah. Well, you know, boy, that's a tough one because uh, John Keel certainly found lots of cases where people were injured by UFOs. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the, you know, so one of the things that Greer uh, talks about is, is that um, there are UFOs that are ET and there are UFOs that are ours, like the U.S. <clears throat> um, or let's, let's just broaden it to humanity. Um, and that uh, the abduction cases and things like that are uh, human initiated in order to continue to spin the threat uh, type initiative. Right. And then I think I saw something uh, the other day, uh, Jacques Vallée released a thing saying that there were confirmed or I don't know how the word wording is, but there was there were uh, abduct uh, fake abduction cases in like uh, Brazil and some other places that were orchestrated by the CIA and the military. 
Yeah, I believe that. I, yeah, there's no doubt. This is the is this is the central problem. Looking at any part of it, deciding is that part? Are we looking at a man-made part of it or or a uh, natural part of it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and that's. One of these keel books that I did, you know, I've done these compilations. One of them, I really made sure to clarify that point because uh, sometimes keel was a little, or the editors were a little, I guess, sloppy in how they they would use uh, the terminology a little loosely, and mm-hmm. it didn't really show you that keel believed that there were man-made versus natural ufos <clears throat> but it's a very important thing to realize and then to apply to whatever you're looking at yeah well and that's the thing is like the, the thing that i struggle with is this very black and white viewpoint you know with greer saying that they're only good and and the other crew saying they're just a threat and i'm like it's like looking at humanity some of us are nice some of us are bad some of us some countries have ill intent some don't i mean it's why does it have to be a black and white issue yeah, and I and I don't know if I can remember it exactly, but there was like a four-way equation that involved that was about how you could see a UFO or have that kind of experience. Mm-hmm. One was uh, uh, you see it, and then or, or, or they can be they can be triggered by electrochemical processes. You can see a UFO because your brain is hit with a certain electro electrical or chemical thing Mm -hmm. and you and under lab conditions even and you will see you know something Um, you can also see that in the field because you're out there and the the stars are a certain way and the geomagnetic magnetic forces around that place if you're in a mound area or some portal or window area or skinwalker ranch boom it happens that way um, but there's a couple of other ways it can happen too, which are, sp- are spinoffs of those. Like, uh, and that's where I kind of can't remember it exactly. Uh, but you can. Uh, Is it in a book we can read? <laughs> <laughs> What's it's in book? one of those Keel books? <laughs> but there's 12 <laughs> of them. Uh, so that's the problem. Yeah, yeah I can't really remember. You just have to read them all. They're like they're like those Pokemon. are the two basic. The two basic ones are that uh, you know that it's that it's uh, well, they're both the same, aren't they? They're both being caused by. Uh, I guess I guess it can it can go in reverse. Oh, that was it. It can go in reverse. You see something that you don't know what it is, and it can um, it can uh, trigger the stuff that's the electrochemical processes within you. <clears throat> so anyway, I didn't do a very good job of that. And I knew I shouldn't have tried. <laughs> no, you're fine. <laughs> but I did want to say that another thing that I did, which I think made the spooks do something was I discovered Joseph Smith's original Masonic aprons here in the Worthington, Ohio. Really? Yeah, and I reported on it at the time, and I think that was, uh, must have been around the same time as when Keel died, 10 years ago or a little bit more. Uh, I wrote an article, or I put it in a book, and I talked about it on some shows. And so what it proves is, and I took pictures of them to make sure, right, uh, proves he was a Mason first, because he was, he had his apron when he was 11. Mm-hmm. So what is, you know, what's that all about? Because he supposedly was not was uh, not a Mason, supposedly was killed by Masons, et cetera, et cetera. And here they are, the Masons have his, his aprons on display. And, I, and I, it caused, I won't say it caused a firestorm because I don't think anybody for, this is the weird thing about finding something that's true. <laughs> It's no one wants to hear it. It it really is unbelievably. uh, This is really what's going on. Well, it's interesting because I just watched a documentary about the bombings and stuff that took place in Salt Lake City over all of the like fake Mormon uh, antiquities and things like that, that this guy had like 
forged all this stuff showing that uh, Joseph Smith was saying other things and stuff like that and that there was like a huge market for anything Mormon historical stuff and then of course now that makes me want to have Alan Greenfield talking about this with the masonry stuff too <laughs> I'm like this is fascinating well, guess what happened within a year they they moved them they were gone mm. yeah it's I was reading I'm sorry, I was uh, reading a book about uh um, subterranean bases or something like that written by uh, Valiant Thor um, and uh, there's a lot of uh, similar information um, in that book to what I found in that um, uh, round table uh, between it's like humanoids, saucers you, you, we talked about it the other day I can't think of the, the full name of the book but there's a lot of uh, cross information between those two books but one of the things it talks about is um in in uh underneath mount shasta uh is apparently an old or or in mount shasta the top of it is an old lumerian city and then there was a great catastrophe that that basically sealed the people that were there and, and, and entombed them and they're, they're all mummified based on these accounts from the 1920s um but the people who who found this old city in the 1920s and we're telling other people about it um said that there were there was a room filled with uh with gold plates with all kinds of like inscriptions and writings on these gold plates and that of course made me think about the gold plates of that like joseph dug up well that's interesting because shasta is really at the in the grand scheme of things not far from you know the mormon hub so yeah so I just thought it was all kind of relational interesting. So, Well, I, I guess that's part of the Lemuria or Mu thing where the Pacific was supposed to have not had as much water or there was something out there that sank. Right. Well, and, and, and uh, it, it, we know, I mean, you look at Death Valley, I mean, they, they think, and I'm pretty sure they know at this point that, you know, all that area used to be an inland sea. Um, as far as how long ago it was, that seems to be up for question. But, you know, that area used to be an inland sea, and California was likely an island at that point in time, or at, at a minimum, a peninsula. So um, it's just really interesting to think about just how much, how much the world has changed, the actual Earth has changed, uh, you know, in its entirety of its lifetime, which is like, what, four, four billion years old or something like that. Um, so it's just who knows uh, how the uh, tectonic plates or any of that kind of stuff has shifted around once upon a time that, you know, produced a continent and then now it doesn't produce a continent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was, you know, there was once a land bridge where people were able to walk uh, from Africa uh, to Europe. So, you know, and now there's not, I mean, it's just, you know, but yeah. uh, one of the, uh, before we, because I, I think we're, we're coming up on time and I, and I don't want to, I want to ask real quick because you mentioned it to me in messenger and I, I wanted to, to ask about it. Uh, you said something about um, you actually found Ingrid Cold's uh, house. I think so. Yeah. And, um, I was talking to Alan Greenfield years ago <clears throat> and he mentioned the whole Terry risk thing. You know, and maybe, and, and I know I, I this I wrote about Terry Rist in my books, and this so that would have been two thousand, I don't know, two thousand eight, two thousand ten. So somebody may have. I have to tell you that there's somebody out there who is mining my books for ideas, and they are putting them out there. Well, there's a lot of no. It, there's one person who's doing it. In a well, I don't know how much he's mining ideas from me, but I think it's sort of a. I think he's doing other stuff. If if you follow my stuff at all, you'll kind of be able to figure out. Uh, I don't know. I guess this is a person you'd have to like look at and say why. Why are you doing this stuff? But there's other people too that are just sort of picking picking stuff, and it's not so much that it's not plagiarism it's just kind of like 
kind of like um, slimy a little bit. <laughs> you know, there's people that have picked up on uh, some, uh, like the idea about the uh, Mothman traveling in a ball of light. Well, that was picked up by the people that did the blue avian thing. They also took some stuff from the movie Avatar, but they also took some stuff about, and this was all, as soon as my books were done, like 2011, all this stuff started, somebody just mined them for ideas. And, and I, I'm, very, I'm very skeptical about a lot of the things that come up because I recognize them. And, and it's like, was I really that correct, you know, on the, all these things? Or is somebody just sort of, because the day after I was on Coast to Coast, first time, which was 2011, uh, he took my, my list, my name off of the Wikipedia page for Mothman. It had been there for 10 years, you know, and it was his IP address. And he had done a bunch of other stuff <clears throat> on Wikipedia, inserting himself into other people's biographies and everything. And so the very day after that show, I'm gone from Wikipedia and the very first Chicago Mothman sighting occurs and it's promoted by him and his cadre. So I think that's because it's a replay of what happened on the Mothman lives list on Yahoo. The same players, in fact, trying to steer everything away from the, my view and Keel's view where we agree, we agree on most points, you know, that it's a, that it might be a Garuda, that it has these qualities of being an avenging angel, so on and so forth. And if you read the Keel compilations I put together, you get a better idea of what his ideas really were rather than just, you know, the two or three books that most people read. So I bring it up because it's currently happening again, <laughs> but now I've got more people, you know, there's nobody left uh, behind really, there's, other than the people on the list today mm. who are trying to manipulate it, there isn't any other people from the old list around. And so uh, I wrote about some of the stuff in my book, but a lot of people were like, uh, maybe you're just imagining, imagining it. But today, if you go to that list, you can kind of see um, what's happening. It's, it's happening again. Um, I'm older and wiser now, so I'll, uh, I'll weather the storm. But uh, what was the original question? Did I forget what we were going on? Uh, you, you, found, you found Ender and Cole's Oh, right, house. right, yeah. Um, so I, uh, Al, uh, Alan told me it was Midway, West Virginia, but he thought it was the Midway down near Huntington, which is where the Hellier guys went. Right. Um, and I tried to tell them, you know, <laughs> that it's not the right Midway because that's not really a town. Midway, that's just like a, a shopping center or something. Midway, West Virginia is between Point Pleasant and Charleston. And uh, it actually connects to my road, to where I, my neighborhood, through back roads. So you could go, if you were Indrid and you wanted to come and hypnotize my family like he did, or go visit my friend and do some psychiatry on him, or firebomb or uh, car bomb Harriet's dad, or shoot my dad with something, you could do it without ever going on the major roads. <clears throat> and so, and also, interestingly, between Indrid's home in Midway and my house, if you go the back way on Route 34, you go through Liberty, West Virginia. And if and a lot of people don't know this, but Liberty is the uh, centerpiece of a grand, <laughs> great conspiracy theory called Project Bluebeam, which is where William Dean Ross lived there and claimed that they were doing, that they had located a portal, an interdimensional portal, and that the um, the NSA and CIA and the Russians and everybody else was working on it to try to uh, replicate a natural portal in a synthetic setting. And that they were doing this at West Virginia State College, which is in Dunbar on Route 62. <clears throat> um, that's where the Tad Jones sightings was too. Um, mm. And I, I took some courses there at West Virginia State once. So anyway, and he names names, uh, you know, he says it was headed up by uh, CBD Scott Jones, I think, this the CIA spook that was involved in UFO stuff. And uh, he said his wife and he were uh, stalked by various men in black vans and they were shooting beams at them to try to, 
you know, make them sick or whatever. And, uh, and I printed it in one of the Gray Barker compilations. I think it's um, Fire, Nazis of Fire, maybe. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with those? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. One of them has Project Bluebeam as listed as a chapter title. Uh, yeah, you should be able to do a, a search in the book there. There's Saucers of Fire, Saucers of Fear, and a third one. I think this is the one with the Frick Brothers on the cover, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, yeah, I found Midway. I drove up there. I just saw this place and I'm like, that's it. <laughs> I know that's not very scientific, <laughs> but you know, it's abandoned. And even though it's abandoned, all the stuff's there and there's signs that say keep out. And so it just, I don't know, I can't, anyway, what we did was I went back with the Frick brothers and we had the ghost box and I put all this in uh, Mothman shrieks or Mothman squeaks. One of those, the, the, the ghost box sessions that we did were fabulous, scary, terrifying. I never did another one. I'm like, I can't do this. This is too, too freaking real. Like the box was telling us stuff. Like, you know, Charles Manson lived in North Charleston when he was a kid and he burnt down a school mm -hmm. on our right there where we all saw Mothman. So we, you right. know, that's one of my theories was Manson being controlled by the, the demons. We think there's a demon there or demons and that Mothman is there in the, in the, in the uh, aspect of a Garuda as a first responder, always keeping, trying to keep these demons um, under wraps. That's what I think is going on. Mm -hmm. And Manson may have been under the influence of the demons, burnt down the school. Uh, why am I on Manson? Oh, um, well, we went to Manson's house and the ghost box, ghost box I think, said his name. <laughs> if I don't read, <laughs> I mean, just incredible stuff. Yeah. And then we went to, I don't know if he said Manson's name, but he, he definitely said Indrid Cold's name mm -hmm. when we went to that house. And we said, is this Indrid Cold's house? Yes, Indrid. I mean, it's just like, what? Come on. And we all heard it, and I taped it as it happened. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> it was Frick's box. It wasn't mine. I wasn't even holding it. I had nothing to do with it. I was just there with the camera. <clears throat> so it's just incredible stuff. The whole series was incredible. And I'm hoping to get it on the Amazon where people can stream. Just haven't gotten around to it. All the materials in the books mm -hmm. and in the books, Mothman photographer, one, two, three, uh, Mothman squeaks, speaks, shrieks, all the transcriptions of those interviews that I did, and then all the sh uh, radio shows that I did about the Mothman story. Hmm. And it's a little bit better that way because I could, I was able to fix things that I'd said on camera that weren't quite accurate. But there is something about TV, you know, it really is yeah. <clears throat> powerful and people like it. So I, I have one last question around Indrid. Um, you know, we have, uh, Stefan and I have talked about, uh, in, you know, in the show Hellier, uh, you hear Tanya say that uh, Carl and Connor came and visited her one night and told her that Indrid had died in a crash. And um, we, Stefan and I, you know, I think <coughs> kind of reject that, that, that thought process that, you know, that, you know, he didn't die either, either he, you know, evolved or, you know, became something else or whatever, but it's not necessarily that he, that he's dead. Uh, I just, you know, I think in, in our conversation, you, you, your, your thoughts are the kind of the same way that he, he didn't die uh, in a crash. That's right. Um, did I mention that I, that at the end of the first season, the climax, <clears throat> there's a dramatic point where their music is playing and they're reading from a book and it's flying saucer to the center of your mind. Right. Yep. And it's this stuff about whatever it was. I don't remember. I wrote it <laughs> and, and they never, they didn't realize it was me and they never, you know, like uh, referenced it. But I, I just want to give myself a pat on the back. Well, yeah, you deserve <laughs> that. Pat you deserve it. <laughs> I said I'd have a little clap for Andy there. Yeah, uh, Andy. But no, it, they did a great. They did a great job. They read it. The, I mean, it was really it worked. It was exactly what they were shooting for, and and I really sometimes when I write these things, 
I am in a zone and I, and I feel like I'm channeling something <laughs> that that's Josh, uh, yeah. is going to do just that. It's going to, it's going to give somebody, um, what they need to get them onto the next, whatever. Yeah. But I did, I told, I told Tanya after she said he had been killed, I said, I think you guys said you thought the same thing. Well, I did too. I thought that's a fake out because I personally believe it. Uh, well, it, it, it's, uh, I think Indrid is part of the value Thor thing, the yeah. crew. I think they're work together. The combo, so, yeah. Valiant Thor is always doing these fake outs. And this is built into whoever created Valiant or, or, or worked. I think it was all, mostly Gray Barker is like 99% of Valiant Thor is Gray Barker. And some of it got appropriated by uh, Tim Beckley who made it into Commander X, yeah. but it's supposed to be Commander Thor. And Tim Beckley took a lot of Gray Barker's stuff and just sort of repurposed it. He put different, slightly different titles. Um, in many cases though, he used the actual formatting that Barker had used because Barker did hundreds of books. And in some cases only did two or three or four or five, 10, 20, very small runs. Some of them are mimeographed. And and Beckley was the person, the minute Barker died, Beckley went down and got them all. So he then put those out under Commander X and stuff. And so what I was trying to do through my contacts and people that told me what was the story, the true story was, was I was trying to get it back to what it was for, the, the kind of stories that Barker had originally done. And And I had things to go from like notes and things or the actual manuscripts or like if he had done one in some cases he literally only did one copy of stuff he he typed it up and that was it so but one of the threads with valiant thor is he's always faking he's always saying he's from a different place because of security concerns yeah <laughs> whether that's you know true or not i don't know but that's the story <clears throat> and so um if indrid and valiant are working together um <clears throat> then um he would definitely do that well yeah i mean it, it really felt like almost like a um disinformation type situation you know like we're gonna we're gonna tell tanya this because she'll spread the word but that just that just gets the heat off of me and i can you know move a little freely well, or whatever i mean even now she's come around to the other side of it saying oh you know that was a fake out too so well yeah it's the minute i called her or no i texted her or something i don't know facebook and and i said you know that's probably a fake out and she immediately started saying it was a fake out yeah so she she agreed with me yeah on that. so well, uh, Andy, I think, you know, it's been a, a fantastic conversation. Uh, fascinating. I know I saw Stefan several times writing a bunch of notes. We, we've oh, definitely got so a lot of, <laughs> we've really got a lot to look into. Um, but yeah, we would gladly help in any way. Um, yeah. you are a wealth of knowledge, sir. And I thank you so much for taking your time, sharing some of it with us. And, uh, don't be surprised if we're messing you on the sly, still asking questions. Cause we have a million. Yeah. <laughs> so. I mean, one of the things we like to do is is, is build relationships, and I and I think that uh, uh, ours would be a, a good relationship to hold on to if we can. So. Absolutely, I agree. Thank you, guys. Absolutely, and uh, you know, again, thank you so much, sir. And uh, we'll. I, I like what you're doing. Thank you. We thank you. We like what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, keep keep it up. Keep publishing them books. Uh, keep it coming. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm just, I need like a, uh, an, an Andy Colvin, uh, distribution network. Like, yeah, uh, I know well, I want, you were talking earlier. I know I'm hanging on forever, but it's like, no, don't hang up. You hang up. Um, but I, it made me think Josh, the way you were talking about like, Oh, you have so much cool stuff. I don't know what I'm missing. It's like, it makes me miss the old days where they would put the little mini book catalog in the back of the book. Yeah. You could rip it out and send it in to get the, like check mark the books you're missing and get them like that's that's what i keep waiting for i'm like where's the little check mark in the back of the book <laughs> well i keep waiting for somebody to say hey we need a hillbilly guru to do a spot on our show every week <laughs> there you go man <laughs> where i can practice my 
West Virginia accent. As you need, to, you need to hit up Joe and those guys in uh, Wild and Weird West Virginia. <laughs> 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 they, they'd eat that up. <laughs> Wow. Thank you so yeah. much. Uh, and Andy Colvin. Wow. Um, you guys have got to get to Amazon and just pick up all of these <laughs> books that he's edited, helped co-write all of these things. Um, I, I'm going to go create a wish list right now. I just. know. I'm like, <laughs> there's just, uh, what do I want for my birthday? Just pick and any book off of this list. During this, I had to look up his YouTube page cause he kept talking about, um, you know, the Mothman photographer thing, which is on there, but it also has a bunch of his music too on there. So I'm like, oh, I'm going to be listening to your music, <laughs> Mr. Colvin. Um, but it was great. He did mention this, uh, after we had stopped recording, he had mentioned, he's got a new book coming out, a new John Keel book, uh, coming out that he's edited and put together called the pickled finger of ET said it should be coming out pretty soon. Uh, yeah. maybe this week. So be on the look out for that on uh, Amazon and whatnot. But yeah, support this fool. He is. <laughs> I love him. I love him. What a great. And yeah, man, uh, I want to get him and Olaf Phillips together in the same yeah. room and watch him box um, box thoughts. Cause yeah, I mean, it, it, like if we could get uh, him, Olaf, um, uh, uh, Greenfield and in uh, and like a uh, 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 Tyler all together. Oh, Oh, a round man. table if you like the <laughs> dude and then give me and you like two red bulls and yeah join in <laughs> i'm there and just let santosh but, meditate in the middle like but i mean it, that's but that like that has to be an in-person thing that's not a zoom we would all just talk over each other oh yeah oh yeah i would be so down i would be so down we would need to like everyone has to have their own personal camera so that we could edit it <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> correctly <laughs> right but i mean it would be a spectacular conversation i think yep and i got a feeling it may happen so uh we're gonna yeah. be paying attention to that so keep keep your eye on this show guys i mean our our guests are coming out of the woodwork um and we're learning i mean i there's i i took so many notes i have so much stuff that i want to look up um and it's right here and i'm like oh man i'm ready <laughs> i'm ready to start <laughs> researching and looking and um and it's kind of it's sad now because most of our research recently has been pushing us towards the southwest you know but now with colvin it's like pushing it back towards yeah. you know west virginia well and, like, and it's and it's and it's and it's really weird how it uh ties into some of the stuff we've been getting on wristwatch I, I know mean, i know that's what i was saying man it's like it's just it's crazy how all that happens and god i could go on and on and up forever especially talking about him mining or talking about people mining his books and works and things like that yeah. we've seen some of that with our stuff that we've talked about yep we've seen it hitting other podcasts and things like that so very very interesting but josh we got to get out of here so um i, I do want to quickly get to our listener story here because we've got a good one um that i want to get to remember you guys can send your uh listener stories to us just an experience that you've had send it to us doesn't have to be um edgar Allan poe here just no. send us your story to fearscape podcast at gmail.com okay this one comes from lisa um this is a listener from uh florida i always felt watched in our bedroom of the house that we sold a year ago I used to refuse to go into the closet. It was this really large walk-in closet because I always knew that I was not alone. I could feel eyes on me every time, if that makes sense. After about five years of being afraid of my own closet, <laughs> well, I called a medium. She came all the way down from North Carolina and I'm from Florida. Uh, I didn't tell her anything about our home or any of our experiences that we've had here in this home. Not one single thing. She walked through our entire house and when she got to our closet, she looked at me and she said, there was a little girl in your closet. She said, she plays hide and seek in your closet. Also, I had been feeling, uh, at times, someone climb into bed with me at night. I mean, I could literally feel the bed actually sink down where a knee would go when someone was to climb onto the bed. 
this medium walked over to the bed and said, the same little girl climbs on the bed. She said, the little girl sees you as her mother figure and is with you quite a bit. Also, my three dogs used to run upstairs barking like crazy for no reason at all. And the medium said, the little girl loves playing with your dogs. She said, she calls them upstairs to play with her. Well, after hearing this, I noticed she hit the nail right on the head and I became more intrigued. So I decided to contact a psychic from South Florida. She shows up to my house two weeks later. This psychic tells me the exact same thing as the medium. Now, how can I dispute what was said when these two professionals knew nothing about my house, nor did they know each other? I couldn't. We moved a year ago this April. And I'll be honest with you, I couldn't be happier because, I mean, now I live in a nice, quiet, spirit-free home. And for the first time in 21 years, I am not afraid to walk through my house in the dark. It was so bad at the other house that my husband put motion lights in every single hallway and in our room, in our home, so that I wouldn't walk into a dark room anymore. There were other things that went on in that house, but the... But, you know, I just wanted you to know and others to know that there are times that I felt like I wasn't alone and you're not alone. Wow. Whew. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Um, absolutely fascinating. Um, I, I will say here that... Um, the two psychics both essentially showed that this was not a malevolent spirit. So it sucks for the spirit, you know, that she was constantly afraid. I mean, again, this always goes back to Andrea Perrin saying we were afraid just simply because that's what we thought we were supposed to be, you know, and, and there's that there too, that there, that, uh, you know, Lisa was not a type of person that wanted to work with that spirit. And so uh, I hope that the next person that is in that home uh, may be someone that that can handle that or work with that if it is indeed just a, a little girl that's looking for a mama yeah i mean indeed well and, and i can i mean i can understand if if you don't and and i'm trying to think of how to say this nicely if but if you're not necessarily you don't, you don't want that kind of attention right yeah um that, then it could be off-putting for a long time. I mean, um, our wives are like that. You know, like they're coming around yeah. a lot more to the idea of spirits and things like that, but they're also like, I, I don't want it. Right? And that's okay. And that's okay. Um, but yeah, uh, please send your, send your stories to us. We're here to listen. We're here to support. We're here to help. We're here to do whatever you need. Um, you know, uh, but you know, one way that you can help us, of course, is to, uh, you know, help us get heard more so that more people around this globe can have a place that they know is a safe place to listen to stories and can share yep. their stories. Um, and one such way you can help is a word of mouth, tell people about the show, but our biggest one is fearscape podcast.com slash support there you can join our patreon um and and join wristwatch like we talked about you know you heard the ad in the beginning yep. there you can join wristwatch join the mystery get behind the scenes stuff or just simply you know paypal us you know if you want to just shoot us a small donation we'll take it fearscape podcast at gmail.com that's perfect for paypal if, if you're interested in just doing something simple like that or purchasing a t-shirt or whatever from our store there are so many ways that you can help it but mostly my big one is word of mouth just keep telling yep. people because yep. we keep getting more and more new stories all the time and uh we are just absolutely fascinated and we love you guys so much but i'm gonna get out of here because my love fest is done josh <laughs> yeah i mean it, but but yeah i mean it, it's uh the more that the more that uh, you you continue to share um, the show, you know, again, I, I don't think that we'll ever, you know, be millionaires uh, from doing this. It'd be nice if we were, but I don't think it's going to happen. But just the ongoing 
um, conversations and topics and community that comes from doing the show is a reward. It is absolutely a reward, and I'm so glad we can share it with everyone else as well. Um, but let's go ahead and get out of here. Thank you guys so much, as usual, for tuning in to Fearscape Paranormal Podcast here on the Fearscape Media Network. Make sure to check out all of our other podcasts on the Fearscape Media Network at fearscapemedia.com. Uh, this has been Stefan. Keep your eyes to the skies. This has been Josh. The truth is now. And remember, folks, hold those blankets extra tight because things tend to get spooky when you're listening to Fearscape. Good night, everybody. Good night. We hope you have enjoyed this guidepost on the road of high strangeness with us. And we thank you, as always, for listening and joining our caravan to the weird and unknown. Please consider supporting us as we continue our journey to find the answers we all seek. Fearscapepodcast.com forward slash support.